Welcome back to the Flyers Nitty Gritty Podcast. Getting gritty with it with your host, Yareev Wallach. My partner in crime is finally back for an episode, a quick episode with Jamie. Jamie Pascal, how you doing, buddy? Man, I'm doing great. Uh, you know, it's great to be back. I haven't been back in a long time. You know, but it, with the kids, man, it's tough. <laughs> it's sound- tough, man. You're pulling your hair out. You see all my gray hairs here? <laughs> it's starting to come in. I'm starting to show. I, I don't know if that's my age or my grades or what, man, but... uh. You know how it is. Uh, it, it's great. Uh, it's great being a dad, but uh, you know, it, it's great to talk some hockey too. Yeah, happy to have you back, buddy. And yeah. uh, and our guest, our special guest for the evening, Craig Eagles. Craig is a scout in the queue, uh, a broadcaster, color a- a- analyst. Sorry, uh, for under Rogers, I believe, right? Um, and has a, a long scouting background, coaching, and teaching. From what I understand, right? High school teacher as well. Um, so really diverse, Craig, uh, thank you for joining. Really excited to talk, uh, hockey, uh, and, uh, talk about yourself on the podcast. Well, thanks for, for having me on, uh, both, both you guys do amazing work and I really appreciate the opportunity uh, to come on and, and talk a little bit about my path in the game and, um, and the Quebec major junior hockey league. So, um, yeah, I've been scouting for, as a New Brunswick regional scout. This is year four for me um, in the, in the queue. So I'm scouting 15 year olds, uh, and projecting them into the queue. I started broadcasting, uh, hockey, uh, locally here with Rogers, uh, TV in 2009, uh, and started writing about the game in, in, uh, 2012 as well. So, um, yeah, it's been exciting and I'm, I'm very blessed and, and very fortunate, uh, to have a supportive family and, and to, uh, kind of, live out the dream here uh, locally uh, in, in Moncton and, and continue my career in teaching as well. So was this always your dream, what you're doing, would you say? Well, to be honest with you, it's, it's in kind of incredible. Um, I, I never would have imagined anyone really wanting to talk to me about my path in the game or, or, um, so yeah, it's a dream come true. And, and here's a flyer, a little flyer story for you and, and guys, you'll like this. Um, Dave Poulin, uh, is, I would consider a good friend and and no one knows this. I have told it to a select few, so I'm saving this one for you. And, and Dave might be upset for me telling you, telling you this, but, um, it was a snow day and it was one of those mild snow days. So it, uh, here in, in New Brunswick. So we just got dumped on 20 centimeters and then kind of lightened up. So my, my kids are, are playing, you know, driveways cleaned out. And I reached out to Dave um, a few days earlier just to kind of pick, pick his brain. Really, the question was, how do I showcase my work without kind of getting, you know, so far out there and, and trying to promote, self-promote, showcase my work without self-promoting. And, and I think we all understand that that's a hard thing to do. Um, and, and Dave, the light bulb went on in, in that conversation. I, we spoke for about a half hour. He's very gracious with his time. But Dave made me realize that you have to stay in the moment. Sure, I, I, you know, I'd love an NHL scouting job. I'd love a NHL broadcasting job, but when it boils right down to it, family's first. Um, I, I'm a husband. I'm a I'm a dad. I'm a teacher, and I'm able to to do all the other things in, in the game of hockey, writing, broadcasting, and scouting. And I don't have to leave my hometown, which I'm I'm. That's the dream, I guess, if if that makes any sense. And and Dave Poulin. Um, really put a lot of things in perspective for me. And, um, you know, he, he's, he's a great broadcaster. He was a phenomenal hockey player, but he's an even better person. Yeah. He's one of the best undrafted flyers to ever, you know, put on that Jersey, you know, and, uh, him, Tim Kerr, you know, it's pretty special flyers nail it with undrafted free agents. But, uh, Dave, I have heard, I've never personally met him, but I have heard that, uh, he is quite the, uh, a quite he has quite a personality and that he's very caring to people and that's really what made him so 
But and, and that's and that's Jamie. That's why he he was such a great leader in the room, you know. Yeah. And and when when he came over to the Bruins again, Bruins fan. <laughs> when he came over to the Bruins, you know, he was a monumental leader. And and oh yeah, yeah. Um, again, this is Dave Poulin. I I reached out to him. He followed me um, on Twitter, and I was blown away. And I sent him a message, and it was around uh, Jonathan Petrie's, um, you know, and we we spoke about Jonathan and the impact that he was having, and you know, just an inspirational kid. And and uh, I I was writing for a Bruins fan page at the time, and and I just on a whim I said I'm I'm writing, and I I'd love to do an an interview with you, and I didn't I, I didn't want to pick up the phone because I didn't want to bother him. So I said, and I, I regret that. Um, but I should have, I should have, I emailed him the questions, but I should have called him, but we've obviously since we we've talked over the phone and, and believe it or not, um, you know, he, he's reached out to me to kind of get a perspective on some Q guys and some, some NHL uh, prospects playing yep. in, the, in the queue. And, and I respect that. And he, he's just a, a monumental, um, person and broadcaster and, and like I already said, a player. Craig I, Craig, I love what you said there just overall about your, your whole, just your path and how you kind of, you found out that, Hey, there isn't kind of one way to go about this, right? You can kind of have your own version of what you want. And you're like, Oh my God, I'm like interacting with NHL teams and scouting yet. I'm still teaching. I get to do all these different avenues that fulfill you. And like, quite honestly, like who says this is the end, right? Like, this is, this is your portfolio or whatever your resume as you move forward, right? You know, if, if I was an organization, right, I'm just thinking from a professional mindset, right? If I was an organization and I'm looking for somebody, right, I'm going to look for somebody who's good with prospects, right? I'm going to look for somebody who can manage. I look for people who do certain things, people who are loyal, people who know the communities there. Especially if I need like maybe next level scouting or whatever, people to run programs. It's just like you look at somebody who runs a diverse background. It's almost like, being a well-rounded athlete, right? Like Jonathan Taves, right? Like you, you know, that guy will play almost forever. Like Sean Couturier on our team, they're going to play forever because they can play every single position, like literally, because, you know, it's just such a diverse set of skills that end up making kind of this elite athlete. Um, sounds like you're kind of building that over time. It's different, right? Than the stories we hear. You mean it is, it is different. And I'm, like I said before, I'm very fortunate, but it's the people along the way. Mm -hmm. And, it's those connections. And I never, you know, everyone says the hockey world is, is such a small world. Um, and I, I never really imagined that, you know, being the truth, but it is. And it's those connections that you make. And, and especially in the, in the scouting world, you might not agree with, with the person. And if you have those conversations, you, at the end of the day, you still have to draw your own conclusions and, and from your own experiences within the game. I get emotional talking about my coach and mentor. He's been gone for six, uh, six years. He passed away at cancer. Um, but every, every aspect of what I do in the game, Dale Turner um, is, is part of that. So very, very fortunate. And uh, thank you uh, for, for that because that diversity and, and um, is really important. And I think being a broadcaster has made me um, – better scout and a better writer. And you could say, you know, that about all three of those things. So uh, very, again, very fortunate. Yeah. Craig, before I cut off, I just wanted to ask you a question about Elliot, the uh, destroyer. Uh, <laughs> excuse me. I stand corrected. Elliot, Elliot de Noyer. And we are seeing that a gentleman that was blocked from, great Moncton, Moncton teams the past few years. I mean, their teams were very, very good. So it was no surprise that he was blocked. Um, now he's finally getting his chance to showcase his skills. What do you think his ceiling is? Do you think it's uh, second second line, maybe top line, maybe third line, I should say, or fourth line? Because, I mean, right now he's, he's tearing it up uh, for rebuilding uh, Halifax Moosehead Club. Uh, he's playing with a comrade that he's very familiar with, with Zachary El, El Haru. Yep. And he is projected to be a first round draft pick for the upcoming 2021 NHL draft. 
What do you think his ceiling is? Because uh, he told me last week he was a playmaker and not a goal scorer. And I think <laughs> players tend to talk down on themselves. So I just wanted your thoughts on that. Well, that's a great question, Jamie. I, from a from projection standpoint, I think this kid is um, – and, and I was able to, to reach out to uh, Richie Tebow, the director of hockey operations uh, for the Moncton Wildcats, and, and their head scout, uh, Alex Gauthier, um, who know Elliot very well, obviously, um, today. And, and just to kind of pick their brains and um, about how they projected him at, you know, where he would be at 18, 19 in the league. I think, you know, Elliot is a perfect example of a kid that continues to mature, to, continues to progress, knows what it takes to get to the next level. Um, a lot of people around here were, were, and I'm just being honest right now, a lot of people were surprised um, that he went as early as he did in the draft. And I think that's props to the Philadelphia Flyers scouting staff because um, they've projected um, and done a, a tremendous job. Now, where do I see him playing at the next level? I think he's going to be probably a bottom six guy, but he's skilled enough and he's so reliable and accountable in all three zones that he's going to be able to probably move up the lineup. Now, is he a, is he a top six forward at the next level? He's got to increase his speed. He's got to work on his agility. Um, you know, at 5'11", you have to be explosive um, yeah. off the blocks. And, you know, I again, NHL comparable. Corral, Sean Corrali is six foot two. But I see a lot of, and Corrali's a good skater. Um, I, I would say Daniel um, you know, puck skills are a little bit better than, than Corrali. Corrali's got a little bit better shot right now. Um, but I think Daniel is that type of player. You know, let's see where he is in two years, guys. You know, and I, I really think he's going to be that bottom six guy. Um, I, he's playing through the middle. I just talked to my buddy, Will McLaren, who also writes for the uh, QMJHL here. And w Will likes him through the middle, you know, and obviously he's playing with LaRue. Uh, LaRue is a very skilled player, but there's another young player that needs to work um, again on his skating and, and his speed and his explosiveness. I, I spoke to three NHL scouts when I, when I wrote the feature on Zachary um, earlier uh, this month and, and, you know, he, he understands the process. And yeah, I think yeah. Elliot really understood the process. And, you know, you mentioned the Moncton Wildcats, three different coaches, guys. This kid played for three different coaches with the Wildcats. And, you know, coming in with Darren Rumble, Darren was an offensive guy. Darren tried to put him with offensive players. Right. He was, as a 16, he was playing with Mika. Mika's here. Jamie, you know Mika quite well. And, and Jeremy McKenna, the Summerside Sniper. So McKenna's signed a, a contract in the American Hockey League with the uh, Toronto Maple Leafs organization, oh, wow. yep. so, and, which is great. So Elliot was kind of always that guy going in, and this was out, uh, what Alex Gauthier said. He was always that guy going in the corners, for, you know, making space, setting up plays. So Elliot's right. He's a playmaker, but, you know, he's worked so hard, and this is what Richie Tebow said, He's worked so hard on his skating the last two years, and especially this summer. The long layoff for him, and I spoke to him during that layoff, and he credited, you know, hard work and, and, his, and his family for, you know, and the article that I wrote about him was, you know, hockey is his life, and, and he gets it. He understands mm -hmm. that. So, you know, props to the, that young man for putting in the time to increase his agility and his speed. And, yeah. you know, the proof is in the pudding right now, guys. He's, yeah, exactly. he's like, uh, That's actually what I wanted to ask you. If you think so – it seems like there's a double element here, right? Uh, all right. See you, Jamie. Thanks, Jamie. Sorry. Yeah, see you, buddy. Nice seeing you. Legend. A legend, Craig Eagles. <laughs> Thanks, Jamie. Thanks, buddy. Take care. Pleasure to meet you. You're Thanks, you Take you. care, buddy. Will, too. Take care. Thanks, man. So it, it, it does seem like there's an element here of is it just opportunity – 
or is it his skill set, right? I obviously it's probably a combination of both, right? It's definitely a combination. It usually is, you know, I, that's what luck is, right? It's when opportunity meets preparation, right? So the kid's obviously been doing his work, but you look at the kind of tear he's on right now. And again, it's an early sample size, it's the beginning of the season. If he's in really good shape, right, he can obviously take advantage of that. But, you know, it's a goal a game pace right now. I know for the queue, that doesn't mean, you know, everything, especially for sprints. But, you know, what do you see with kind of a jump in production like that overall? Because it seems to me like it's everything, right? Like it just kind of clicked, right? And maybe it's temporary, but what do you think that is? Well, I don't, it's a, that's a great question. Um, again, I don't think it's going to be temporary. Um, I think right now with um, the Q kind of bubbled uh, with the Maritimes division, he's going to see all these teams over and over again, right? So, um, the Quebec league is, is bubbling in Quebec city right now as well. So they're going to start that, which is exciting. Get those games in, but yeah, Elliot's going to continue on this pace. Um, nothing is going to slow him down because he's so reliable and accountable in all three zones that he's not going to substitute his, his offensive play and, and just focus on, in on that. He's a complete player. And when they, when they first drafted him, you know, I saw him at 15 uh, at the Gatorade Challenge, um, which uh, two Quebec teams are there. All the Maritime provinces are there. And he, he was a fantastic 15-year-old. Uh, and get this, he played midget, midget hockey at 14, hmm. right? He, so he, 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 he's always played up a level. That's so now, you know, really, you know, this is his third year in the league. He's really starting to, to excel and, and come into his own. I don't think he's going to slow down. And I think with him playing through the middle now, um, you know, his production might go down slightly with Zachary uh, LaRue um, serving a, a, an eight game suspension. He, you know, that might dip a little bit, but you know, the goals he, he's scoring, he's going hard to the net. Um, he's creating time and space for himself. He right. has the breakaway speed. So um, yeah, there might be a little slowdown in, in, in goal production, um, but his point production is going to, stay, it's going to maintain because he's used to playing, um, against all these different defenses and, and, and schemes and setups. And, and plus they're pretty good on the power play. You know, you got Justin Barron, um, and Cam, why not? Why not's a good prospect. He's a B, B, uh, listed prospect in the, uh, in the NHL players to, to watch, uh, prospects for the 2021, uh, NHL, uh, draft. So, you know, he's going to get points on the power play and it's, it's just tremendous to see a player like Elliot come into his own that really focused on the defensive side, put up, put up points in Bantam and Bantam and midget. And then his point production, like Alex Goche said earlier today, his point production kind of dipped a little bit, which might've caused his draft stock in his draft year to go down a little bit, but Moncton were really excited to, to pick him up. And uh, because he was so reliable in all three zones. So as a 16 year old, he was doing things. He was making plays like Jacob Pelche. He was, he was very, very reliable defensively, which um, I'm an old school scout type guy. I've only been in the scouting world for four years, but um, like I said earlier, but I, I look for players that can play the two way game. And I think the flyers do as well. Um, Absolutely. You know, and, and the Bruins do, you know, that's the original six mentality. Can you play both sides of the puck? And, and Elliot Daniel A certainly can. Yeah. And, and, and you look at a game like that, it, it seems like he's could be one of those guys who maybe is a coach's favorite, right? Cause he's got the, from what I understand, the character was already there even before the numbers. Um, and now if you deliver, right. And you're doing everything the coach is asking of you, you know, and you're producing, like, you're just going to get minutes. You're just going to get thrown out on the ice all the time. Maybe even you're not the most talented guy, um, you know, on the ice, but he's going to play with talented people because you're going to be reliable where maybe the guy goes in, uh, maybe it's a, a forward on the team that maybe he's a little more high risk, high reward. You know, he, they're going to rely on you to be more um, reliable, right? More consistent on the ice, right? So it allows other players to kind of excel. Um, he seems like that, that type of guy potentially, right? Well, yeah. And, and I think that's why Darren Rumble, uh, again, former flyer for you. Um, that's why I think Rum's really want him to, to play with Sear and McKenna because he knew that he was 
defensively re- reliable. He knew that role. Now, when when uh, Torchetti came in, Denoye's offensive production, you know, kind of dwindled a little bit. He was more of a defensive role and put in that role. And then when Dan Lacroix came in, um, you know, they were so deep. And I think Jamie alluded to, um, you know, several times they were so deep last year that a lot of people saw Denway's game trending the other way. And there, there was talk of, you know, could he p- be potentially moved at the deadline? You know, we knew that LaRue um, and, and Denway were going to get moved eventually. Um, it was just a matter of time. And then when Benoit Olivier grew and Jared McIsaac were acquired, everyone knew they were going back the other way. So, but yeah, he, Denway actually went down and played. Um, and I, I hate saying this went down and played, but they were the best third line in the queue with mm-hmm. Philip Daou, who just recently got drafted by the Ottawa senators. There's a story in a half and Jacob Hudson. So Jacob Hudson is Dennis Bondy's nephew. <laughs> All right. So Jacob, there you go. So in Anganish, Nova Scotia, they grow them tough and mean. And I'll tell you, Jacob uh, Hudson, complete player. He's wearing the C for the, the Wildcats as well. So Danny Wayne went down and played in the, on that line. And boy, oh boy, that was the best line the Moncton Wildcats had. And if, whoa, Craig, that's a big statement with all their talent. That line created and... Daniel Way was a big part of that because he created time and space. He was reliable. And he also had the offensive instincts to get pucks moving, to find the seams. And, and that's what we're seeing in Halifax right now. He's finding those seams and, and he's so quick and agile now that he's getting into those seams. And he always had a good, good knack for the net. Now he's capitalizing mm-hmm. and he's got a heavy shot too. And you've seen him play. He's physical. He's not going to back down, and he and he's going to go to those areas. Well, that's actually what I was going to say. It's almost like he, it's a catch twenty two with him, right? Because he's doing everything the coach wants of him, right? And given it's a very competitive league, but you get relegated to the third line because of the role that the third line plays in your game. Usually, right? You can rely on them usually as a heavily defensive line, maybe a physical line, one that wears. Maybe they'll play against the top line of their team, but they'll start in the defensive zone yeah. you know and, it, and it's it they know that you're going to get the puck out of the zone that's why you're there that's why you're there but you don't necessarily get the same opportunity we had that with sean couturier um because couturier is just so good defensively from the time he was 18 they just threw him on the fourth line and you know how is he going to put up numbers and from what we understand he went to the organization himself and said hey i i'm ready for more yeah. and and with denoye it sounds to me because just going off of what you said in the beginning He's a young, he usually plays up, right? For his age group, he's usually younger. There's a confidence issue there, mate. Maybe he's all with all these better players, kind of gets hit a little bit confidence wise, also moves to a new team, sees a new opportunity. Maybe people are excited about him. Maybe they said something to him. We see you as this type of guy, and he kind of just runs with it. And I feel like for a kid, you know, one, six months is a lot of time of development. Two, confidence is probably, you know, maybe 50% of the battle. Well, you hit the nail on the head right there because he's playing like, the move again, Halifax hasn't come through uh, into town. We we were in the orange uh, phase for two weeks here in Moncton. Mm-hmm. Um, our healthcare and, and the province and the government have done a tremendous job getting us all back to yellow. So mm-hmm. you know, loosen the uh, the restrictions during COVID. So I haven't seen him in person this season, but boy, have, have I seen the highlights that you mentioned the confidence going between his legs on on the shorthanded breakaway. Like shorthanded, shorthanded, shorthanded breakaway. He's oh, oh, he, he kills penalties too. Yeah, because he's that type of player. So you know, to go between the legs like that and have the confidence to pull that off, he's he's soaring right now, mm-hmm. and he understands that he's been in the league for three years. He understands his role, and now it's if he screws up, big deal. He's gonna he's got the mobility to get back. And he's reliable. He knows he's going to be putting points up. And plus, this is his time to flourish. You know, um, you know, as a player, you're probably thinking, okay, it's it's my time now. You know, I played on the third line. I played up and down for a time. 
just before COVID hit, we were thinking a lot of people were wondering because LaCroix started juggling the lines. And we're like, why are why is he breaking up his lines? Well, he was trying to find some chemistry okay, with, with different pairings. That's mm -hmm. what he told me. So he's trying to find two different guys and then throw the third guy. Well, Daniel Waye actually found himself playing on the fourth line. And there was some thought that if, if the Moncton Wildcats were going to go far and they were going to go far in the playoffs because they were built to win a season ago, that Daniel Waye would probably center the fourth line. So here is this big prospect and now relegated to the fourth line center position especially playing so well with Hudson and, and Dao, but that's where his line mate, future line mate, Zachary LaRue came in. He, he started seeing some time on the third line and then Mika Sear dropped down. So LaCroix was really juggling. And I think he, he meant to do that just before the playoffs to go back to the playoffs. So guys would feel good about themselves, but yeah, Ding Wei, you know, he's break, he's breaking through and it, Rightfully so. The kid has earned this. And um, I, I'm so proud of that kid and so happy for him. I sent him a little message after the draft, and, um, you know, basically saying that proud of you. you. You earn this. And I think the Flyers scouting staff, I'll say it, you know, I said it before, I'll say it again, have done a tremendous job. And, you know, that confidence of getting drafted and you know how much work you put in. This is he's on cloud nine. He's you on get a cloud taste. nine. You, you get, get a taste, taste of it. You exactly. Taste. You fuel to the fire, right? Right. For a young kid. And um I it's really interesting you say that. So when a kid is get taken at like five eleven, right? He's he's got good size, he doesn't have a bad size, especially modern day NHL. He's definitely built if you're a thicker kid, especially you can be physical in the corners. But what when you get drafted at five eleven and you know, I know he's not the thickest kid either. But do, do teams kind of project, hey, maybe this kid grows another inch or two? Because, they're you know, they're 17, 18 years old. There is kind of room to fill out, maybe even grow a little bit in height. Does a team kind of think that when they're drafting a kid who's about that size? Or do they assume he's going to be this big? Maybe he'll fill out, but, you know, most likely this is his size. Well, uh, another great question there. I think the NHL's uh, scouting world have, have done a great job bringing in um, – you know, biomechanics uh, and, and kinesiology majors and adding them to their, their staff to kind of project muscle mass and, and all those things. It, it's really scientific now. Um, I think with, with Daniel Oye, I think 5'11 is, is probably going to be it. But even at 16, he had a pro build. You know, he mm -hmm. was very rugged. Um, mm -hmm. You know, his, his dad played in the queue and from what I'm told was a very, very rugged, tough uh, player as well. Uh, we had a local, um, you know, a very, very good local player. Um, I, I'm not going to name names, but he made the mistake of dropping the gloves with Daniel Way's uh, dad. It didn't go well. And um, I think, you know, like I said earlier, uh, hockey's life to him. And, and um, I think, you know, projecting, is he going to grow a little bit more? No, but right now he, he does have a frame to build up a little bit more muscle um, through the, you know, through his upper body, his lower body. Like, um, I, I don't know if he's a, he was a gym rat. I, I don't know, um, that, but, you know, obviously he's put, put in the time and effort to get himself in, in tremendous shape. And that's where the quickness comes in, right? That's where the extra step comes in. So like Richie Tebow said today, where, where's he going to be in two years if his skating is trending in the direction that it, it's going right now. Mm. Interesting. And the skating, I feel like is the, one of the biggest elements today is that if you become explosive, you know, it, it's just so much harder to play defense today. Right. And if you can get a step on somebody, it, it just feels like it's everything nowadays, at least to, to producing. And you can see that if you don't produce, you essentially don't stay in the NHL. You might touch the NHL. You might get a few games, but you can't, necessarily produce on a regular level. Um, is that something that you guys kind of focus on when you even talk to prospects? Do you, do you say that stuff to them that, Hey, you know, we're looking at you like this, but you know, if you gain half a step, you know, you're going to move up on, or do you guys have conversations like that? Well, I think, you know, from my perspective, projecting 
15 year olds into the queue. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I, I haven't really done a lot of interviews with kids, um, you know, from, from that perspective, but yeah, so there, there is a big jump from, well, they're, they're calling it U18 now, but from the midget level to the Q level, as far as skating and, and quickness and explosiveness, you know, one telling, um, you know, I asked Jacob Pelche after his first camp with, with the flames, you know, how was it, what was it like? And, um, you know, we'll, we'll leave a few words out, but he said, it's crazy how fast it is. And, and Jacob Pelche, Hey, let's face it. He's, he's got great skills. He, he's one of the quickest players in the queue. He's having a, a great season already with Valdor, but it was just the board work was so much faster and the, and the pace was so much faster. So any, any time I, I talk to kids, that's one um, interview question that I do when, from a writing perspective uh, for the queue, writing prospect articles on NHL prospects um, is asking, what are they working on? And every single kid says they have to get quicker. They have to get faster. They have to be, not one kid said, I'm, I'm ready uh, from the NHL with, with regards to pace, they understand it. They, they, they get it. And once they get the taste of their first NHL experience, they come back and they work 10 times harder to, mm. to develop that. And, and Matthew Joseph is a perfect example of that Joseph is probably the closest player. Um, and, and he played with Thomas Shabbat and St. John in that president's mm. cup winning team. He, him and Shabbat were probably the closest that I've seen uh, that were NHL ready from a skating perspective. And, and Joseph, Hey, he didn't jump all, the, you know, right away into the national hockey league. He spent, you know, I think close to 40 games in the American hockey league, just to kind of hone in his skills and, and at the pro level. And then obviously, you know, his name's on the Stanley cup. So, you know, projecting Daniel Waye, he's, he's going to have to get a, He's going to have to get a lot faster, um, yeah. but the, all the makings are there. So, to, you know, that's a long way around answering your question. But yeah, every every prospect that I that I talk to, that's the question, and and they understand that it's just it, it's it, it's a step above. It so, really is. So let me ask you this. Um, oh, I just lost my I just lost my question. I just lost my thought. Um, Oh man, it was a good question too, and it's totally gone. Hmm. What we? Um, oh man, it was a good question. Oh, when you when you're like looking at these uh, these athletes, and you're like you see a kid like Daniel Ye, right? So you'll see Daniel Ye, and you'll see an explosion of uh, production, right? But then you see another guy who also has a similar level of production. To an average fan, we're, you know, we can't keep track. A lot of people, you know, they have jobs, school, whatever. They're just watching scoreboards, right? They're just watching stats. And there's always this kind of assumption that if a kid is a high producer, he's going to come to the NHL, he's going to produce like that. That's not really the case. So what do you think is that difference that you look for when you see somebody producing? You know, what, what are the things that you're looking for that makes you think, hey, this is translatable to the NHL level? Um you know, or he's going to be maybe an average player to a star player. Like what, what is it about the stats that stick out to you? Like if I'm going to look for statistics, what is the real bubble that it's going to get me super excited for maybe a potential superstar or star player in the NHL? Well, first of all, I'm not a big stats guy. Um, my broadcast partner, <laughs> my broadcast partner, Jerry Green would, uh, he doesn't like that about me. Um, <laughs> I, I'm not, I'm not a big stats guy. Um, for, for me, I tell kids and, and midget age kids that you have to play to your identity. You know, if you're a goal scorer, you're going to score goals, mm -hmm. but you know, what, what are the intangible intangibles that you bring to the game, mm -hmm. you know, and you know, are you a character guy? Um, are you a good two way guy or a good teammate? Do you bring the compete level every shift? Those are things that Daniel A did at 15, 16, mm -hmm. 17, 18. He did the, all the way through and those intangibles have certainly paid dividends right now in his game and it's freed him up. It really has. Um, so those are the things that I look for, you know, it, it's kind of ironic. The first, my first viewing of Philip Dau, 
I tweeted it out. Like the kid was incredible. And he was only, I think he came into camp maybe at 150 pounds last year. Like this kid was a hundred pounds in his draft year, a hundred pounds in his, in his midget draft year. What? So a hundred pounds. He and that's a real it. number. That's a real number. hundred pounds, a hundred pounds wow. at 15 years old. And he, and he was playing, he was a phenomenal player yeah. and, and, and they signed him as a free agent. Okay. They, had, they had eyes. They call him the rocket Ismail. They're one of, one of the wildcats scouts. He, he's their free agent guy out of Ontario in, in parts of Quebec. He's got a great eye for the game. He, he found them. He found them. And, and now Dao put on weight. He's about 165, 170 pounds. He's growing. He's still growing. Right. But it was just the way that he protected the puck, bought time and space, but his relentlessness on the forecheck and the back check. Like mm. this kid, I, I interviewed him the night that he signed and, and I should have taken a picture of it, but like I was kind of behind the scenes and I'm like, no, let the kid enjoy the moment. This is a special moment, but he scored three goals in an exhibition game. All right. And I had a chance to interview him. The highlight of the night for me wasn't the three goals. They were impressive. The highlight for me was a pass on the power play where he tried, he saw that it was a split second decision and he threw the puck across. All right. It got picked off, but it was the right play to make. Guess who's back check? Guess who back check and, and turn the puck, you know, gain, gain possession of the puck again. Mm -hmm. Philip Dawu. And as soon as the, the minute I saw the kid play in, in practice in, in the, in a red white game, I said, this kid's really good. And I went right to their scouting staff. I said, where'd you find this kid? He's like, they're good. eh? he's pretty good. I'm like, exactly. So can you think the game? Can you skate? Can you protect? Can you create time and space for yourself and for others? And the points are going to come. This kid didn't have any points. He didn't have any points. Torchetti had him playing on the third, fourth line. All right. Dan Lacroix, coaching change, right? Philosophy change. Coaching change comes in, comes into effect. The kid blossomed. Blossomed because he did it all the right way. And he, he faced that adversity. And, and that's a big, big thing. Have you faced adversity all the way up, up through? What does the game mean to you? All right. What do you value? Where do you see yourself as a, you know, valued in, in the lineup and where, where do you want to go and what are you doing every day to get better? Yeah. And just to translate what you're saying there, it's like that shift. And I, I know exactly what you're talking about. That shift represents his character. Yeah. Right. You're like, you're watching the way his brain works in that moment. Like what is going on in his brain, right? He wants to make the play. He obviously wants to give somebody a point. Right? He wants to score, he wants to win, but then he also has the drive to drive back, right? To to really, I, I remember there's a lot of great players who were really good at this, even at the NHL. Like Marion Hosa was a player you would always watch the back check. Pavel Datsu, these are guys who they want that puck from you immediately after they lost it. Yeah. And like, I kind of understand what you're saying, right? You see a player's personality in those little shifts, they don't always, do, you know, produce a goal, right? Or a point, but it's, it's, does that mold into character? Plus, when he inevitably fails or hit as a wall, is he going to apply that same methodology to kind of pushing to the next level? So you're looking for little character cues almost on the ice. Well, and, and you know, getting back to Daniel A, Daniel A had those things. Right. He always was on the defensive side. Even, even the offensive zone or in the neutral zone, he was always reliable. He was always there. He was always taking the body. He was always taking the man. He was always making the right decision. He'd always pass early on the two on one because he was thinking the game. And, and, you know, that's, that's where, you know, can you think the game? Can you process the game at that level? And, and Daniel White has that, that skill and he's relentless enough that even if his skill gets in the way, his drive and determination is going to get him. Like he, he's going to be a pro. He'll be a pro. And, and, you know, he's a pro's pro because he gets it. He understands. He understands what he has to do to get there. And I think, you know, that mindset has really developed over the last year and really the last six, seven months. And, and you can tell it. 
and, and it's a telltale sign, like we talked earlier, it's his confidence. Yeah. And, and making the pros is so difficult. And we, I talk about this on this podcast quite a bit and, and the Twitter verse, you know, it's a little hard to, to kind of see the respect that a lot of these athletes really deserve for even playing in the NHL and how rare that is to even make your way through the AHL or to sign an ELC and how like, these are the 1% of the 1%. These are, you know, they're the best players wherever they go, you know, typically. And then they have to hit a wall when they realize that there's another level above that. It's just, um, it's such a, such a mental journey. It's so hard for me to call any of these athletes like lazy or anything, anything like that always. Um, but I, I love hearing about that because to me, it's, I feel like I'm, the mental game is really the toughest part about making to the pros and the, the consistency of your training and improving on your training. And, you know, it's like going to college for the average person, right? But every year you go into college, you actually have to be like, oh, well, I need actually, I can't stick with straight A's. I need to get eight straight A's plus, and then I need to get straight A plus again and again. It's like literally, even if you did the best you could, you need to do better every year because the competition just gets more serious. Well, you got you to continue to prove yourself and prove your value, you know, yeah. as, as, a, as a character player. Um, you know, and we're seeing that with obviously the, you know, the salary cap era, mm -hmm. you know, organizations are putting so much more value on young players coming up through and their developmental, um, model in the American hockey league. And, or, um, you know, you look at, um, you look at the Calgary flames and, and Brian McGratton, you know, he's, he's brought on from a de developmental standpoint, um, you know, with players, not on the ice, but off the ice, what are these players doing on their downtime? What are they doing, um, right. you know, away from the ice? And I think McGratton's a perfect example of, of a person that could really give back and, and provide um, guidance in that, in that area. And you're, you're seeing more and more emphasis put on the developmental, um, you know, aspect of the game because they, those, those organizations know that, the bottom six is just as important as your top six. You know, you're going to lock up your top six guys and, and your top four guys for long term. But those bottom six, you need the Phil Myers of the world stepping up and, and really challenging your, your top four. And, and, and Phil has done that. So, you know, Danny Y.A. is going to have to, you know, go through all the steps and all the stages um, to get there. But like we just talked about, you have to do that day in, day out. And you have to prove your value consistently on a consistent basis or you're to find yourself in the East Coast and, and, or the American Hockey League. Yeah, and actually, perfect segue there because this is actually exactly what I wanted to talk to you about was I wanted to transition into Phil Myers. So I think it's perfect that you brought him up. So we have some flyers that are – you know, from the queue, right? Um, we, we have some good ones, some guys who have – you know, like we have like a Sam Moran. I wanted to ask you about Sam Moran as well. Um, I, I don't know if you, you were obviously weren't scouting at that point officially, but obviously it's the Q. Um, but Phil Myers for us, I mean, I gush about the kid. I, I kind of speak, I make these player profile videos and I, I kind of say this about Phil Myers, that he is a representation of how deep the Flyers prospect pool really is, um, that they have a guy like him just kind of waiting there where in the past he would have been kind of our prize uh our prize prospect, especially on the back end. I see him as a perfect complimentary top pairing defenseman. Like he played with Thomas Shabbat, right? A guy like Shabbat is maybe like a true number one, but then I think, you know, Phil Myers, that guy could be a number two. He just ha seems to have it all. I know the mental game has to obviously catch up and you got to play perfect, but phys physically the gifts, they seem to all be there from the skating to the size, to the grit, to the confidence. What do you think about Phil Myers? What do you think about his, am I, am I overhyping him? Am I, you know, no, <laughs> I love that face. What do you think? Well, here's a kid that played high school hockey. Okay. High school hockey in grade nine did very well. Everyone was talking about him. Goes to the midget AAA flyers program, plays a year there. Rouen draft him. Perfect scenario. Because the Ruan Naranda Huskies do it the right way. They give time and they, we were just talking about development. Mm. They allow their players to develop every year. Mm. And Phil Myers, Jeremy Lozon, same type of kid. 
Okay, sure. Did they help thee scratch them? They came in together. Yeah, they helped thee scratch them a few times as a 16 year old, but that was to get them ready. They played the same amount of games and by 17, boy, oh boy. Right. And then, you know, you have to credit Ron Hextall. And I know, you know, a lot of Flyers fans might think, oh, well, Hextall did this and Hextall did that. That's fantastic. I well, personally love Ron Hextall. Well, yeah, and I had a chance to interview him um, at the at, during the the last season of the the Moncton Coliseum. Um, he was a great interview, really quiet, which and reserved, and, and yeah, um, I, I I didn't expect that. So um, it, he was a great interview, but Hextall saw, and I, I still can't believe Phil Myers went undrafted. I still can't believe it. I can't believe it. Shocking. But again, skating, you know, all this stuff, is he going to grow into, you know, can he process it quick enough? All those things that scouts kind of get, oh, well, I don't know. You know, they're very hesitant about, okay, Myers put the work in. And I'm very uh, fortunate last summer, I didn't see him, obviously, they were playing, but, um, you know, very fortunate to, to be able to go into the rink and see Derek Cormier. Um, and, um, and, uh, Legier, Legier, uh, Rick Legier is in the gym. Derek Cormier, 18 year old, uh, 18 year pro European, uh, PM pro Cormier and, and Rick Legier work with Phil Myers at pro evolution hockey during the off season. And, and to watch Phil go through those little drills, um, offensively and defensively and, and really see his edge work. It's just like, wow. Yeah. It's incredible. Great. Jordan Murray, uh, he's playing in the K right now. Um, he was uh, playing with the uh, the Belleville Senators last few seasons. Jordan was there as well. So you're seeing more and more players from Maritimes have success. Um, but Phil Myers is a step above. Hmm. He's a step above. And it, it starts in the gym. It starts on the ice. And, and you're seeing it. And I'm really surprised that the Flyers haven't locked him up long term. And if I was the Philadelphia Flyers, he'd be my top priority. He'd be yeah. my top priority. And I, I don't know if you're going to bridge him. I don't know if you're going to do this or that. But Phil Myers, you, you have to have Phil Myers on your, on your back end moving forward. Yeah, no, I, I 100% agree. I think it's the only reason the Flyers haven't kind of made any kind of panic moves with we lost Matt Niskin into retirement yes. early, right? But Phil Myers, again, it, I'm making an assumption, but I th I believe he knows that. And that's why this negotiation is taking a while, because I think Phil Myers knows ultimately where he's probably going to end up. And there's, you know, we have three kind of staples right now in D and Shane Goss, but unfortunately, he's kind of dropped off. Um, from this group, but we have kind of those three staples right now of uh, Sanheim, Myers, and Provorov. And right. Myers is the right-handed. Yes, we've put Sanheim there, and Sanheim is very good. And I would say he's a year older, so he's a little bit ahead of Phil. But Phil Myers has everything to kind of be the perfect complement to Ivan Provorov. And I bet they would want to lock him up long term, um, probably make him a little more expensive because of that. Maybe that's what's. Well, like. how, here's the question. That? Well, but, here's a question for you. How much would you pay him? The, how much I mean, would you offer? How much would I offer? Yes. Speaking of the fact that I have leverage over him, I would offer him too low, but I would say I would definitely try to give him max term that he'd be willing to accept. And that's the issue is he's going to be pretty good. And I don't know if he's going to want less like average uh, a year. So like, cause long-term he could be a seven, $8 million defenseman, you know, no down question. the line. Right. So he's not going to want to take a six year deal at three million a year because I think he's going to be like, well, I can get six million maybe in, in three years. Right. So, in my opinion, he'll get a bridge because of that. And the Flyers will kind of be like, okay, who are our top four? Right. And they'll, they'll think Provrov, Sandheim, Myers, and then they have one open spot. We have Phil, um, we have Cameron York, we have, uh, uh, Igor Zamula, these are two guys who might lock in there. And then the other guys are, I don't want to say replaceable because they're not replaceable, but yeah. you can rotate other names around that six. So I think that's what's happening. I personally, Phil Myers is locked up long term. There's zero downside. At the very least, I see him being another Braden Coburn for the Philadelphia Flyers, right? A guy who can, who almost never gets beat on the back check. Um, he's physical, he's mean, he's nasty, he's got an offensive game. 
But if he doesn't end up being a 50-point defenseman, he's still going to be a high-value defenseman who plays 21 minutes a night. Um, but I think he's more than that. I, I think he do, does have potential to be an all-star um, type of guy. Well, wow, you hit the nail on the head. And his puck retrieval is getting much, much better. He's more confident. He's more calm and poised with the puck. You saw that in the playoffs. You know, his first pass, um, his ability to, to, you know, be elusive coming around the net and beating the first guy and making that play either up through the middle, um, his ability on the power play, his shot, um, his instinct um, is, is only getting better. I, I, I definitely, I agree. They're going to try to bridge him. Um, again, I'm not an agent, but I, I, I'd be trying to go for a 3.75 or, or low fours right now. If, right. if, if I'm, you know, if I'm the Flyers, that's, that's where I see them sign them for two years with the promise. Listen, kid, we're going to pay you. You'll get paid, but we need you at this right now. And then, you know, and then at the end, and then, yeah, we'll, we'll sign you. And, and even if they, they give them a three-year deal, you know, 3.75, four point, you know, whatever, and then bump them to 5.1 yeah. or 5.2 in the third year, something yeah. like that. He, he won't get it though, because Sanheim makes less than that, makes less than that. And I think that's, that's what they're going to do because Sanheim plays right now about 19 minutes a night. They're only giving Phil Meyer. They do this strategically. I know they do, right? They give him 17 minutes a night because when they pull, put him into the end, right? And it's not that they're holding him back to be mean. It's for his development track and how much money they have allocated, yeah. right? So they, so they literally look at it. Okay, you're a 17-minute defenseman. We're going to pay you that way for the next year or two. Right, we're gonna pay you probably a little bit above that, right? So I think he's gonna get somewhere between two point five and three for two to three years, and yeah. then after that, I think that's where he'll probably double his salary yeah. um, in the uh, you know moving forward and get term. And, and it, it's really years. unfortunate that that he's only playing seventeen minutes because yes. the kid can log minutes like you wouldn't believe. Well, he, he's got an there's engine. It, that there's his just, chance. Well, exactly. He's got an engine that he he, he never quits. He never quits. He never that, that ca- those character plays that you're talking about. Well, right. And, and that's, that, that goes all the way back to the adversity, you know, he faced in, in, in Rouen that it goes all the way back to there and, and the job and the development they they've done and him and Lausanne, Lausanne is, you know, in Boston, again, he's finally finding his way at the NHL level. And I, I predict that uh, Lausanne is going to have a big, big year in Boston, especially if, if Char decides to go elsewhere, which I can't, I can't see 33 leaving, but mm-hmm. Lausanne is going to be thrust into, you know, their, their, their top six. So, you know, he, he's got to play big minutes and, and he's starting to do that. And and I thought he had a good season last year. He was playing very well uh, before the season ended. And then the restart, it took him a while to get going, but um, you know, Myers, it, what he did in the playoffs with flyers, incredible. I, and, Again, hopefully they lock him up because he's a great kid and, um, you know, he's, he's a quiet, you know, you know, this, he's a very, very quiet, reserved young man. Um, he does his talking on the ice and, um, it's, it's great to see a local kid, um, do so well and at the NHL level. Yeah. And, and it does feel like the sky is the limit for him a little bit too, right? Like, um, it, it seems like he he seems to get better every year. It's kind of what we're talking about. They all have to get considerably better every year. Otherwise, you know, it's kind of the end of the road for them, uh, unfortunately. Um, well, listen, so we've done over an hour, so I'm not going to, I don't want to hold you too much, but this was, this was really awesome. Um, I loved the feedback that you gave us on these players. Um, uh, you know, obviously, Daniel, yeah, I feel like I know him much better after speaking to you. Um, to well, thank get, you. you. Yeah, you know, we're looking to get the intricacies because there's, there's so much to all these stories that everybody likes to throw these kind of sweeping statements about, oh, I know what this guy, this, my most and most disliked statement is I know what this kid is already. I hate that. I see it on Twitter every day and I'm like, I have no idea what you're talking about. They, they take a guy who's 23, 24, even 25, 26, and they're like, oh, he is what he is. I go... I'm 33 and I just grew up. So I have no idea what you guys are talking about. As far as I'm concerned, it's an everyday battle. And some of these kids might turn into stars. 
at 25 years old. Who are you to say that? It happens all the time, right? And go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no, that that's such a an excellent statement because um, you know it, it takes a long time for these kids to to figure it out, and and they are just kids. They're just kids. Yeah. You know, and everyone puts so much pressure on on these kids. You know, I, I just uh, spoke to uh, Xavier Borgo. The kid is, uh, you know, he scored 40 last year in the queue playing with Shawinigan. Mm. He, he's, he's a first round NHL draft pick, but he's just a modest kid. And, you know, like he, he's a great kid. And Zach LaRue, great kid. And they're just trying to live out their dream and to, to have so much negativity and BS thrown upon these kids and criticism. It's really unfortunate. It's one of those things that I can't stand seeing, you know, that happen, especially on social media. It's like, no, back off and let them play and let them develop and and let them grow at their own pace. And, you know, don't, don't criticize kids, you know, Oh, it's just one of those, one of those things that I'm very passionate about that um, give the, give the kid, the benefit of the doubt and support them. And, and you're going to see, you're really going to see, um, you know, where they're going to go. Yeah. And these are athletes, right? These are, these are guys who work to win. So to, to bet against them almost doesn't make sense. They they don't think that way. So there's no point of you saying that because they're not, they're not interested. They're not interested in stopping, or any of that stuff. Like that's why they got to the point that they're at. And I, I have this kind of line that I like to say that elite players are developed, not drafted. And most people think that they're drafted, but how many of those kids actually get drafted and turn into stars? Well, like less than one percent of the NHL draft does that. That they come in and kill it. And it's like no, no, they. It's a whole new process after that. So that's a um, great. That's a great line. Great thanks. line. Thank you. You should copyright that. <laughs> copyright right here. It's copyrighted on the podcast. All right. Well, Craig, this this was really awesome. I'm gonna have to ask you back on one time because this was an awesome conversation, and uh, I'm gonna have to pick your brain again one day. Hey, no uh, problem. Sure. Thanks. Thanks so much for having me. Um, you guys do amazing work, and thanks. and uh, it's it's a it's an honor and privilege to to come on. And um, I just want to say this: stay safe, and um, and uh, I'm wishing. Uh, all the best for uh, our friends south of the border. Thanks. I appreciate that. And same north of the border, you know, hopefully everything is just safe for everybody moving forward. I think um, it's one of those times where I just, I'm always wishing for the best. Like I, I've gotten to the point where I'm not really interested in, in arguing too much anymore. I just, I'm hoping for good stuff to happen. You know, yeah. it's just everything all around, you know, just forward progress, just like uh, development. Right. That's and right. Uh, one more time. You have a podcast. I want to know where can people follow you and uh, check your stuff out outside of us? Yeah. So um, it's, it's called the quick shift podcast. Um, we, we usually do it on uh, Facebook live on the FDS podcast network. Um, that's where you can find all, uh, all the articles um, that, uh, that I publish. I also, um, like I said earlier, I, I write, um, prospect articles for the Quebec Major Junior Hockey League as well. You can find those on on their white, uh, website or they're on on Twitter and all their social media platforms. And um, again, you can follow me at uh, e a g s thirty seven. So eags at thirty or at eags thirty seven. Um, obviously, that one. 37 for Patrice Bergeron. So I was going to, I was going to ask you that actually, it just reminded me, I was going to ask you who your favorite Bruin was. Well, was, um, you know, you'd have is, to, is, was, is, well, yeah. Active. Bergeron, active. active. Act, I love that. Active. Yeah. Um, yeah. Bergeron would, would be yeah. up there. I have to go with Marshawn cause he's, he's close. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, played for Moncton and, and, uh, close by in, in uh, Nova Scotia as well. But, and, and Zidane Chara. Um, but yeah, so for, oh, wow. I, I would say Bergeron is probably my favorite player. That's that's awesome because Flyers fans definitely hate that. You know what I mean? And that's how perfect he is. But we're hoping Travis Konechny turns into that guy for us. You know, get everybody wow. annoyed and can do the same output. Well, he's well on his way. Trust yeah. me. You know, yeah. and, and Couturier, um, you know, he's well Bergeron. on his way 
you know, to, to Bergeron yeah. with regards to playing, you know, equally uh, as effective in, in, in all three zones and especially uh, defensively. So it, it's great to see Couturier have so much success this year. That's awesome. Credit That's where awesome. credit's due. Love that. Love that. All right. Well, let's end it there. And thank you so much. Thanks again for coming on. Um, and uh, to everybody who's listening, thank you to everybody. Uh, like and subscribe, please. It helps us out a lot. Um, we have our merch store. You know, buy stuff if you want. If not, who cares? But we appreciate everything. It doesn't really matter. Um, thank you for listening. And hopefully you guys enjoyed Craig because this was really I, – I thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. Thank you so much. And uh, remember to always stay great.